Joining us now is Wall Street Journal staff writer Stu Wu, who covers the relationship between the U.S. and China as his regular beat, and he is in Beijing watching the games. Stu, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jason. What's it like on the ground there? How is the vibe? Um, How has it been, uh, you know, covering the Olympics at, at essentially at ground level over there. Yeah, I think so. These are my second Olympics. And I think the vibe is that, you know, there, there's a lot of happiness here, but it's like really heavily balanced out by a lot of sadness. I mean, I was just saying just in the minutes, just like a minute ago, I was scrambling to download Zoom on my burner phone and set it up so we can even have this conversation. So there's that element, just talking to all the athletes about the apps that they did and forgot to download on their burner phones before coming. Uh, but I think uh, when you think about the, like the main storylines of, of these Olympics, they're, they're pretty sad. You have uh, Camila yeah. Abalieva, you know, just 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 watching that in person was heartbreaking. Even when Nathan Chen won uh, gold, mm. uh, I, I went to a short program. And then afterwards, I was like looking really closely at his mask and he was wearing two masks. He was wearing like an N95 and another mask wow. on top of that. And I was just like, oh, man, this this guy really, really, really wants to win gold to, to put himself through uh, do something like that. And then, of course, you have uh, all the people who got COVID right before, like Michaela yeah. Shriverin, who didn't win good. So I think I, I, this is like the sad, awkward, awkward Olympics, I think. Yeah, uh, the Olympics are always a, a stage for politics, for global politics, for the relationships between nations. And it seems like uh, with COVID being the context for basically everything that's happened on on planet Earth in the last two years, it feels like these Olympics are specifically a showcase for China to say, "We're look how we're doing it. We're doing it uh, better than everybody else." Is that the case? Do you feel like, and and it, is there anything that you could? Do you feel safer there than than you know than at a comparable sporting event as somewhere else? Oh, yeah. Well, first, let me say I, I used to live in Beijing. I, I was in China for the first uh, three months of the mm-hmm. pandemic uh, for, until March 2020. And uh, when it happened, they, they literally shut down my neighborhood. They, they put like a checkpoint. The, the local uh, Communist Party authorities put up checkpoints at each of the six or so entrances to my neighborhood. I had to do a temperature check and show them that like a card that proved that I live there. So I, I knew coming in that this would be like the safest place in the world. And all the athletes feel that way too. I think like two days ago, there were zero recorded cases in the wow. bubble. So we land at the airport and uh, we get this like PCR test that like tickles our brain. Like, like <laughs> they, they put it up your nose and, and you're like, wow, that's pretty deep. And then they go like, like an inch deeper. <laughs> and then, and then, and then you're, you're just begging for mercy. Uh, you're, you're crying. And then we have to take a, a, a throat swab every single day before we leave the hotel. And then not only do you have to wear a mask, but it's got to be an N95 mask. Uh, so it, it is just, uh, I, I would have been shocked if, uh, if I had got, gotten COVID here, any of my coworkers had gotten here. Um, so that was not a worry at all. On the other hand, I mean, it is, it is a pain to wear one of those things for 16 hours a day. Uh, but but th- those are the rules. Eileen Gu. American-born Chinese uh, athlete won the gold medal in half pipe and the silver and in slope style. There's been a lot of conversation about from people on the sidelines about who she is representing. Uh, what uh, essentially asking her to make a choice between China and America that it seems like I, I think a lot of people myself included, would say it's a little unfair to be putting this on her in a way that we don't put on other athletes. Um, is that is that feeling present there? What is what is that like uh, watching her uh, in China? Yeah, that is an unavoidable feeling. So I saw her win her second medal, which was a silver medal. And I've been following her for a long time. I'm also a Chinese American person from San Francisco. I went to her rival high school. I, I actually asked her, <laughs> that my, my, but my first question was, why didn't you go to my high school? And she said, I didn't get in. And I was like, yo, Eileen, I, I didn't get into your high school. So, so that's cool. Um, but so I, I, th- I think you're right. And is there are questions of, is you know, are, um, th- there's a Canadian American bobsledder, for instance, who won gold. She, she doesn't get asked as many questions about switching from Canada to America as Eileen does from, you know, bet- for, for a choice between representing China and the U.S., um, so there's some speculation there could be some racism involved. So uh, is that unfair? Possible. Um, I think what is a fair question to ask, and this is what I asked, is when you choose to represent an authoritarian country like China, there are some compromises 
that you make. And she, she is, a, there's pictures of her with Xi Jinping at a, at a press mm -hmm. conference a couple of years ago. So the question is, okay, are, is, the, is China, is the Chinese government, is the Chinese Communist Party using your medals that you're winning for China as a tool of soft power for propaganda? And on top of that, you know, you're making tons, Eileen's making tons of money in China. You, every time you turn on TV here, she's doing an ad for, for, for a watch or a car or, or milk or something like that, right? Um, so she's making tons of money here, but, but the compromise that she has to make and anybody who does business in China has to make is that if, if you wanna make a lot of money here, you can't criticize the official stance of the Chinese government on human rights or anything like that. So I, I think those questions are fair. We all watched the Camila Velieva uh, situation with, uh, I think, a mixture of frustration at one, what appears to be uh, the double standard for uh, doping penalties levied against uh, Russian athletes and uh, the kind of extreme pressure that she, that was clearly placed on her uh, as she competed and that she uh, clearly affected her in a very serious way. Um, have what's what has been the the feeling there about Camila and is uh, what do the athletes what do the other athletes think about her situation? I I, I went to see her free skates um, and uh, yeah, first of all it's weird to watch figure skating without like you know like Tara Lipinski in your ear right. you know yeah like, yeah yeah I'm commentating yeah. yeah. Uh, so she went last and I noticed, uh, and you know, everybody who was there that night was there to see her. And then I noticed that there's a stream of, of people leaving the arena. And I was like, that's weird. Um, and then I, I looked closely and they were all wearing red, white, and blue. And they happened to be sitting where, where the Americans were sitting. And I realized that Team USA looked like they were boycotting her performance at the end. Um, so I think that gives you an indication of how some athletes from yeah. some countries feel about her competing there. I went back and uh, listened to the Peacock, uh, uh, you know, uh, commentary on the performance afterwards. And I, I think they got it right. I mean, uh, she probably shouldn't have been performing. And then you saw what happened when she did. But um, yeah. again, just being in that arena without hearing any commentary, you just you could just sense tension. And I think in hindsight, um, why, why did we all expect her to win a gold medal after what she went through? It, it shouldn't have been a surprise that she's going to perform like that. As a Chinese American, uh, you know it is it is inescapable that the U.S. and China are increasingly competing for, uh, you know, a, a, a top spot amongst nations. Uh, and I wonder, if it, have you thought about, or do you have any feelings about? the effect that might have on Asian Americans here. You know, I think about the, the competition between the U.S. and the USSR during the Cold War through the 80s and into the 90s. Uh, it was heated. There was a lot of, like, uh, propaganda, a lot of rhetoric. Um, but there was no threat that a non-white nation could possibly supplant the U.S. in the same way that there is with China. And, and with all the, uh, the negative things that could come with that, with the potential for uh, leveraging bias and racism in service of propaganda. Does it worry you at all as we enter this age of, of direct competition between these two nations? I, I think about, uh, yeah, first of all, I think about this a lot and it goes beyond the Olympics. J Jeremy yeah. Lin is a, a Taiwanese uh, Christian athlete playing in, um, you know, for the Chinese Basketball Association's most successful basketball team right now. I, I think about that a lot, and uh, it, it's, it's hard to win because, um, I mean, just look at Eileen's situation, and, and, and right. I think hers is a little bit different. When I lived here, the Chinese claimed me as one of their own. It's like, oh, you're Chinese. You, your passport might say United States of America on it, uh, but you're Chinese. Um, and I would... I would. I was expecting that people like Nathan Chen would come here and be celebrated, but but there's there's nothing about him, you know, um, because I think he has been critical, or at least has raised concerns about politics and, and human rights in China in the past. Even even if he did so very gently, I think yeah. that that means that you're not gonna uh, be able to market yourself, you know, get get endorsement deals in, in this uh, country with one and a half billion people in it. And it, it, it's sad because you're. you're my parents are from this country, uh, you know, his parents uh, or the parents of a lot of Asian American athletes, Chinese American athletes are from this country. You want to enjoy both. But in, in this world today, 
it seems like you really got to choose one. I, I think what's interesting about Eileen Gu is that a lot of us have asked her, why are you staying silent on these issues right now? And what she says is, look, I'm a teenager. I'm focused on inspiring athletes, young mm -hmm. girls at this moment. So at this moment, right? So uh, is she just saying that because that's what just came out of her mouth, you know, right then? Or, or is she leaving the door open for, uh, for other options in the future? She said it twice now. So maybe, maybe she's, she's not, you know, closing her options right now. Take Line is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. I want to tell you about the easiest and most fun way to spice up your season. It's Underdog Fantasy. Woo woo! And their brand new pick'em game. Just pick over or under on your favorite or least favorite or middle favorite or whatever player stats, and you can help win up to 20 times, 20x, 2-0, your money in a single night. Underdog keeps it super simple with their easy-to-use website and mobile apps. Use code TAKELINE to get your first deposit doubled by Underdog. Sign up now with the code TAKELINE, and you'll double your first deposit up to $100 in bonus cash. When you make your first deposit of $10 or more, deposit $100, double it, and you get $100 free. It's easy from here to you know read uh, Xi Jinping's uh, statements and read analysis about where the... Uh, uh, where China might be headed and the things that they want to do in the future. And it's certainly uh, impossible to ignore the aggressiveness with which they counter any kind of criticisms about them by anyone that takes part in their economy in any kind of way. Um, do you have any kind of idea where this is heading? I think originally the idea when, uh, when uh, the U.S. and the West began to engage uh, economically with China in the late 80s and 90s was that this is how we influence them. Uh, it's unclear that the influence is going in the direction that people thought uh, in the 80s and 90s. Do you have, uh, uh, you know, do you have any kind of, um, do you have any kind of feeling about where this is all headed? Wow, you know, so, so Jason, so I, I, uh, I was a sports reporter for four years. Yeah. I'm actually not anymore. I haven't been on the sports team for five years. This, this is the main thing I write about, actually, is yeah. how uh, tensions between the U.S. and China. That's why I'm asking you the questions, uh, uh, Stu. Yeah. <laughs> tech business. So just the fact that uh, I had to do this on my phone because it, it has a foreign SIM card. I couldn't do this on the computer because I don't have uh, access to the Western Internet in my room. The Wi-Fi the wi here is behind the Great Firewall. So we, we already live in this world where there are two internet systems, right? So in China, you use uh, Baidu and WeChat instead of Facebook, Instagram, and, and Google. If you've been watching Eileen Gu's uh, races closely, you're going to see this logo on clothes she's wearing. It's Anta. That's like the Nike of China. But uh, you can't buy it. Uh, that's also Clay Thompson's uh, uh, shoe brand, by the way. Uh, but uh, the U.S. just passed a law that says you can't import cotton from Xinjiang, which is uh, like the uh, which where all these mm -hmm. human rights pieces are allegedly happening. Well, Anta says that uh, we get cotton from Xinjiang. So now we're in this world with this two, two different Internet systems, like one that's Chinese and one that's mainly predominantly American. We're, we're headed to this world now where people might be wearing different athletic apparel, too, because of, of these laws and, and human rights concerns. Uh, and there's some other evidence that like the financial system is splitting, too. Um, look, th these are early days and right now the internet's the best example, but, but we are headed in direction where, where people in the U S and China are going to be wearing different kinds of clothing, using different kinds of monetary systems, buying different kinds of uh, stocks, uh, for their, you know, uh, portfolios. That's the direction we're headed right now. Uh, and it might take, you know, 50 years if, if it completely decouples, uh, but there's no movement towards, uh, you know, being, one global system right now. Just to take the devil's advocate, I think you know the the, the Chinese perspective is something like uh, the U.S. committed X amount of human rights violations in their rise to becoming the preeminent nation on earth. Uh, did all the stuff that we're being accused of doing it now. So we, what's the deal now that somebody else is coming up the mountainside? All of a sudden, it's a problem. Uh, is that kind of the argument that China would make? Jason, you nailed it. That, that's exactly the kind of question they made. How, how dare you, with your history, with slavery, uh, with, with the Chinese Exclusion Act that limited immigration to, uh, from China to the U.S., with, with the internment camps and uh, uh, with the Japanese Americans in World War II, how dare you lecture us? Uh, they do not like being lectured. I, I think that's uh, that to, to some uh, degree that's fair. The way the dialogue is being held right now with a lot of yelling and finger pointing, it's not really conducive. 
to anything. Um, so there needs to be at least a change in the way that these two countries conduct um, conduct diplomacy uh, in, in some way. And, and it might be happening behind doors right now. And it could, and there's a lot of political posturing on both sides in the U.S., possibly just to win votes because it's really popular yeah. bash China. But the way it's being conducted in, in public right now, no, the, the Chinese government hates. And I think there is some fairness behind that. Yeah, I think my concern is, and tell me if if this is a, a legitimate concern, is uh, you mentioned uh, how popular it is here to bash China. I believe that is the case. I think that there are probably uh, uh, many politicians and uh, talking heads who bash China who do so not because they care about human rights, because they want to bash China and that helps them uh, leverage their own uh, talking points, etc. But do you worry that we're in a realm in which that kind of the, the bashing, which is very popular from both sides, can take on a life of its own, no matter what the kind of diplomacy and talks are that are going on behind closed doors? I, I see that in, in Twitter, you know, just, just on Twitter and, and in the comments sections for a lot of stories I write. It's, it's that, um, you know, uh, people uh, just automatically take these really defensive positions on either side. Um, so I have seen that. You know, I will say, you know, you were talking about uh, the, the U.S. and the USSR before uh, people, a lot of people are calling this the new Cold War. You know, yeah. I, I just want to say right now, this is this is not a Cold War right now. Right. They, they, you know, the Cold War had proxy hot wars, right? There's none of that yeah. right now. There's there's we're not doing drills where people are hiding under their, their desks at school because of of a threat of nuclear annihilation. We're not there yet. Uh, and, I, and, and I say, yeah, but we, we might never be there. So so this is more of a diplomatic and, and technological Cold War. So um I, I wouldn't worry about that right now. He is Wall Street Journal London Bureau reporter Stu Wu. Stu, uh, thanks for giving us your first person perspective on these Olympic Games. Stu, that was great. Hey, this was a fun, thoughtful conversation. Thanks for having me.